Topic two, share capital, issuance and retirement. The issuance of share capital may happen after authorize, authorization of share capital is made by the Canadian Business Corporations Act, the CBCA's Articles of Incorporation. And we may record this as a memo journal entry. A memo journal entry just means it is not a debit or a credit to the financial statements, yet it reflects um, a note to the financial statements. Shares are issued for cash, and we would do this. Um, there would be a journal entry for the issuance of cash. So memo journal entry for the authorization of share capital, but then when shares are actually issued and somebody purchases them for cash, then we would debit the crash cash and credit the common shares. If for some reason a somebody paid above the par value, so above the stated amount in the articles of corporation, then we would debit to the cash for cash received, credit the common shares for the par value, and then the remainder would go to a separate account within shareholders' equity, referred to as contributed capital premium on common shares. As we talked about in the prior topic, we only issue share capital, we only issue the common shares when it is purchased. So if somebody purchases them on subscription basis, until the full amount has been received, we do not record the issuance of that share capital. When the subscription is issued, we would first record the, uh, the accounts receivable specific to that subscription, and we would credit the common shares subscribed within equity then as the receivable is being paid down, as we are debiting our cash and crediting that receivable, the common share subscribed stays the same. Once there is no longer an amount outstanding, meaning cash is all received, accounts receivable for that subscribed amount is gone, then we would debit the common shareholders, common shares subscribed, and then credit the common shares for those share issuance. One other thing to note here is that the, uh, the receivable may either go to an asset place on the statement of financial position, or it may be a contra account within the shareholder's equity. The reason why it would be perhaps a contra account to the shareholder's equity is because you are essentially debiting and crediting the same bucket of shareholders uh, equity so that you are not over inflating your accounts receivable. If there is any, any potential risk of not receiving this, the last thing you want to do is for a subscription basis, uh, debit your assets and credit your equity. So making both sides of your balance sheet look better um, without you know, actually fulfilling that. So one way to set it up so that it's neutral is to set up the credit for the common share subscribed on the shareholder's equity. And then the debit, the contra account to that would be the accounts receivable in the same location. Again, either is appropriate and is up to management to decide how to present. So let's look at an example of what I just talked about. Company X purchases 2,000 no par value common shares from company Y for $2 per share on a subscription basis. That payment is due in six months. To record this, we would debit the accounts receivable for the full amount, the 4,000, 2,000 times two, and credit the common share subscribed in shareholders equity. Then when we um, record the subsequent payment, we would debit the cash, remove the subscriptions receivable, and then issue the shares. In the event of a default for share subscriptions, there are three options. This would be dependent on what the contract for the share subscriptions states. 
If the contract says to return all payments already made to the subscriber, we would then reverse the accounts receivable and credit the cash back to uh, the shareholder for what they've already paid. If the issuance um, is that, or for me, if the contract states that the the subscriber would receive a proportion of the amount already paid, then we would issue them common shares for the value of cash already received, removing the remaining receivable and common share subscribed accounts. So just reversing those two out. So <laughs> then um, if the contract states that, hey, any amounts already paid um, would be kept, then we just, um, we either leave it there in common share subscribed or we can reverse it to contributed surplus. So it would just stay in the, um, the portion already paid would just stay in shareholders equity and the accounts receivable, uh, the amounts outstanding would just be reversed out against the common share subscribed. So whatever was paid would be kept. Okay, so now let's talk about the issuance of shares for non-cash assets. This is possible. So while well, we just talked about a company issuing shares for cash, companies can also issue shares for non-cash consideration. And we would record that share issuance for the fair value of the assets received. And when doing this, we would, instead of debiting cash received, we would debit whatever type of asset was received. And if in rare occasion that the fair value of the asset received cannot be determined, then we would consider the fair value of the shares issued. It's possible that we may issue um, more than one type of share for the same payment. So for example, we may issue common shares with um, some preferred shares. There are two methods in which to record the sale of these shares. One is proportional and the other is incremental. Under proportional, we say that if both classes of shares, if the price, the fair value is known, then we would split that accordingly. So we would base that on a ratio of what each is worth. If we don't know one of the values of one of the types of shares, then we would allocate the funds to the fair value of the one class that is known and the remainder to the other. Let's look at an example. DEF issues 5,000 no par common shares and 2,000 no par preferred shares for 80,000. We would then look at the, um, under the proportional, assume that the fair value of one common share is 12 and the other common share is 20. So assume that the fair value of one common share is 12 and the fair value of one preferred share is 20. So in this bucket, there are 5,000 of the common and 2,000 of the preferred, and that entire bucket was sold, or entire basket was sold for $80,000. Under the proportional method, we take the fair relative fair value, which in this case would be 60,000 for common and 40,000 for preferred, and the relative value would be 60 and 40%. So therefore 60,000 of the 80, probably 60% of the 80 would be 48, and 40% would be 32,000. Therefore, out of the cash we receive, debiting the cash, 48,000 would be allocated to common shares with 32,000 allocated to preferred shares. With the incremental, now let's assume that we know that one preferred share is worth 20. And right now it's not the, the trade, the common shares aren't trading for whatever reason, it's unknown. So let us figure out the preferred share value, which is 20 times our 2000. So 40,000 will be allocated to the preferred shares and the remainder will be allocated to common shares. That is the incremental method, when one is known and the other is not. When looking at share issue costs, these are common fees incurred when issuing shares and they can include legal fees, accounting fees, printing, registration, and underwriting.
These can be accounted in two ways, the offset method or the retained earnings method. The offset method is most commonly used. This is directly reducing the proceeds from the sale by the share issuance costs, and this is by debiting the share capital. You can also use the retained earnings method, which means to debit the costs to retained earnings directly, which reduces, me, which allows the gross proceeds of the sale to remain in share capital, but reduces retained earnings. Under both of these methods, the shareholder's equity as a whole remains unchanged. However, it should be noted that if there are costs incurred on a planned share issuance, but that share issuance does not happen, it's not completed, then these costs should be expensed immediately to the income statement. Shares might be retired. Companies can repurchase their own shares via the open market or via private transaction, so long that any relative legislation conditions are met. As long as companies inform the securities regulator of this plan, it is called a normal course issuer bid. There might also be some characteristics of the share which makes them retractable shares, where the shareholder has the option to require the company to repurchase the shares at a contracted value. The shares may also be callable or redeemable, where the company has the option to repurchase the shares. A company may want to buy back and retire their shares for a number of reasons. Perhaps it's to increase their earnings per share. If there are fewer shares outstanding, the income divided by the smaller number will result in a higher earnings per share. We'll talk more about earnings per share in a subsequent chapter. It may be to return capital to the shareholder. So instead of issuing a dividend, the companies may give interested shareholders cash via a repurchase. This is taxed for shareholders as a capital gain instead of a dividend income. Or if there is no capital gain, it may just be a giving them their money back without a tax consequence to shareholders. To bump up the tax value, if a company feels their shares are undervalued, repurchasing some of the shares can pardon me, re bump up the share value. If the company feels that shares are undervalued, Repurchasing some can raise the value of the outstanding shares. There's fewer shares um, for the same value of company, therefore um, it can represent a greater value of the outstanding shares. Perhaps it's to avoid takeover. Nobody else can buy your shares if you buy them first. To decrease future dividends. The less shareholders means a smaller overall dividend. In order to retire shares, we need to look at the standards. There are currently no IASB standards for repurchasing and retirement. So in order to look at the economic reality of when shares are retired, we first need to look at whether or not they were repurchased below what the average price per share issued was or above. If it was below, then we take the average price per share issued and we look at what amount of cash we received. So we would debit the share capital, debit the common shares for the average price of those shares issued. We would credit the cash and then the plug, the remaining for the repurchasing um, of it um, below would be going to other contributed capital from sharehold share retirement. And because that amount would be to offset the smaller amount of cash, that would be a credit to the other contributed capital. Now, if the shares are repurchased for above the average price per share issue, we still have the same setup in the fact that we are debiting the share capital for the um, average price paid and similar to above, and we're still crediting cash to demonstrate the fact that cash is leaving. And then the, um, the the difference to show that we're paying above and beyond would be a debited, uh, pardon me, a debit to um, the contributed capital balance for the same class of shares, um, with the difference being to retained earnings 
So if there was um, a previous for the same shares where there was a credit, um, like there was from up here, then we would remove all the credit amount by debiting it to remove it. And then um, the rest would go to retained earnings. So it shows that the company is using some of the value that they have stored up through income from previous years to pay back this amount. If there is no amount, from a repurchase when the shares were below the average price per share made, meaning there was no related contributed capital balance for that same class of shares, then that entire plug amount would go to retained earnings. In a share conversion, many shares include the condition that they may be converted to a different class of share at a stated ratio. These are often looking at preferred shares may be converted to common shares. In this instance, we would take the book value of those preferred shares, reverse those out, and that would be the same amount allocated to the common shares. So debit preferred shares, credit the common shares for the same amount. The economic reality reflected in this really goes back to when those preferred shares were issued and put on the books. So all we're doing now with the share conversion is reflecting the fact that you know the person had the right to convert and they did convert, but the value impacting the company didn't change because that was already captured upon the initial sale when those shares were originally issued. The conversion nearly reflects the types of shares that are now outstanding. Let's look at a question. If shares are repurchased for above the average price per share, which of the following cannot be debited in this transaction? Is it A, share capital, B, retained earnings, C, contributed capital for the same class of shares, or D, other comprehensive income or loss? If you answer D, other comprehensive income or loss, you would be correct. In order to record this transaction, we would be removing the average price of shares for debiting share capital. So we would be debiting share capital. And we would be removing any contributed capital from that class if appropriate. So if we had purchased it from below share price previously, there may be a debit to the contributed um, capital from the same class. Then the rest would go to retain earnings. So each one of these is plausible. Um, this is mandatory and each one of these is plausible in this circumstance. Other comprehensive income, while it is a part of shareholders equity under IFRS, it is not a part of this share repurchasing. So that's why D is the correct answer. We would not be debiting that in this transaction. Thank you and I'll see you in the next video.